Indiana Jones and the Lost Treasure of Sheba Written by Rose Estes and read for you by Daniel Estes When we left off last, George was faced with a difficult decision. Either he could catch a train back to Addis Ababa and stop risking his life, or continue on with the hope that Squint and his brute of a companion would assume that he and Indiana Jones had died. So far, George has shown great determination and courage, and I think it's going to take more than two creepers to scare him off. So, let's return to our adventure and join George and Indiana Jones on their quest for the lost treasure of Sheba. We decided to keep going, and luck was with us. We worked our way back up the slope and followed what was left of the trail. Suddenly, there was a raucous braying, and both of our mules, which we had assumed were dead, galloped up. They stuck to us like glue for the rest of the day. We spent a cold night on the mountain. Once, there was a terrible shriek and a burst of hideous laughter. I sat up abruptly, wakened out of an uneasy sleep. Go back to sleep, kid, Joan said, and I saw that he was still sitting up, holding his rifle. It's nothing. A lion just caught his dinner, and the hyenas are waiting for the leftovers. I lay back down, drawing the blanket over my head and curling up on the cold, hard ground. Maybe Jones had been right. Maybe I shouldn't have come. Boy Scouts hadn't prepared me for avalanches, broken dams, and people who tried to kill me. My head hurt. My muscles ached, and I wanted to go home. I woke to the smell of coffee. Warming myself over the small fire that Jones had built, I watched streaks of pink spread across the gray sky and inhaled the cold, sharp air. The fears of the night faded with the first sip of scalding coffee. We had just finished our coffee when there was a clatter of rocks and Squint and Frito staggered into the camp. Fredo's arm was tied up in rags. Jones leapt to his feet and grabbed his rifle, but Fredo and Squint just limped to the fire and collapsed. What happened to you? snarled Jones. Avalanche, whispered Squint. We was right behind you. We almost got killed. You need more practice, said Jones. A good hitman isn't supposed to get caught in his own trap. But Fredo and Squint did not respond. And for the first time, I wondered if Jones and I had been wrong about them. Jones must have shared my doubts because he said no more. And after giving them coffee, we broke camp and continued on our way. Fredo and Squint were too tired to give us any trouble and dozed on the backs of their mules for the rest of the morning. Around noon, we came to a deep gorge. A bridge made of thick ropes anchored to boulders spanned the gap. Just looking at it scared me half to death. Do who? We have to use this? I asked nervously. Is there some other way we can cross? They wouldn't have built bridges if there was another way, sighed Squint. Well, George doesn't like it, said Jones, so I'd take it as a deep personal favor if you boys would look for another way. You go north, and we'll go south, and we'll be back here in an hour. Fredo mumbled under his breath, and Squint looked unhappy, but there wasn't anything they could say, and so they left. As soon as they were out of sight, we doubled back and Jones dismounted and led his mule across the swaying bridge. What are you doing? I yelled. Crossing the bridge. What does it look like I'm doing? Growled Jones. Unless you want hardy boys back there trying to kill us at every turn, you better get over here too. But I thought they were looking for another way to cross. I wailed. Will you grow up? This is the only way across, snarled Jones. They only did what I asked to keep us from suspecting them. They haven't given up. Now quit stalling and get over here. With my heart in my mouth, I led my mule across the bridge. No sooner had I set foot on the other side than Jones began to hack at the ropes with his knife. Well, that should take care of them, said Jones as he cut the last rope. We watched as the bridge swung down and crashed against the far side of the ravine. Then, mounting our mules, we rode off down the trail. It took us another week to reach Lalibela. But the roads were thick with pilgrims, and there were no more attempts on our lines. As we entered the red walls of the city, Jones wrapped his robe around his face so that only his eyes were visible. I followed his example. Fascists, 
hissed Jones. Glancing around, I saw that there were soldiers everywhere. What are we going to do? Let me think for a minute, said Jones. Pulling the mules into an empty courtyard, he pondered the problem. There's safety in numbers. We could stay with the pilgrims until we get a chance to explore. Or we could just brazen it out. Even if they do spot us, they're not going to start trouble with Americans. After having finally arrived in Lalibela and successfully ditching their dubious companions, George and Indy are faced with a new problem. Fascists. Should they try and blend in with the pilgrims and play it safe? Or take a chance and trust their American identity will protect them if they are detected? Tune in next Sunday to discover what they decide in our next episode of Indiana Jones and the Lost Treasure of Sheba.